The Lady of Elche, a limestone bust that was first discovered in 1897. It was found at an archaeological site on a private estate, two kilometers south of Elche within Spain. Currently exhibited at the National Archaeological Museum in Madrid, the artistic influences involved in creating her are a heavily debated topic. This undoubtedly due to her unusual appearance and the fact that no one seems to be able to pinpoint her origins. According to the Encyclopedia of Religion, the Lady of Elche is believed to have a direct association with Tanit, the goddess of Carthage, who was once worshipped by the Punic Iberians. Though at best, this could be perceived as a guess, based on vague similarity. Clearly, the most striking and intriguing detail surrounding the Lady of Elche is her mysterious and possibly advanced technological appendages. Positioned around her head and flowing down the bust, the original function for these strange decorations is unknown. The current academically accepted view is that the originally polychromed bust is thought to have represented a woman wearing a complex headdress, while well, some scholars suggest that the sculpture is Iberian and associated with Tanit, the goddess of Carthage, others have proposed the work reflects a long-lost Atlantean goddess. The unusual features of the sculpture, such as the quietly kept detail that she had an elongated head, has led many independent researchers to suspect the spools were not part of a unique headdress, but was a type of lost technology reflecting the highly advanced nature of the lost and forgotten Atlantean civilization. Art historian John F. Moffat, along with most of academia, agree that the shape of the lady's eyes, nose, and other features were too delicate to have been carved in pre-Christian Spain. Therefore, predictably, instead of suspecting that an unknown, highly advanced civilization could have possibly created it, Many academics have simply concluded it to be an elaborate hoax, regardless of the compelling evidence upon the statue which displays its true antiquity. And also of the fact that in 1997, the mayor of Elche fought to have the bust of the Lady of Elche returned from the National Archaeological Museum of Spain in Madrid to the city of Elche, to be on display during celebrations of the city's 2000th year. It was to be a special exhibit but the petition to have the bust returned was denied. The director of Elche's archaeological museum, Rafael Ramos, argued that it was preposterous to say that the statue could not survive the journey, noting that more delicate pieces are transported around the world regularly. Do these sound like the actions of a group of people who suspect the artifact to be a fake? Or does it sound more like the actions of a group of conspiring individuals with an aim of retaining a valuable, yet largely unknown relic. Is the statue of the Lady of Elche a long-lost Atlantean bust? Or maybe a leader of a group of beings whom once visited Earth? Questions surrounding the Lady of Elche largely remain unanswered. How did she end up in a farmer's field in Spain? The disputes and specialist theories surrounding the Lady of Elche clearly illustrate the secret importance of the bust. Just who was the Lady of Elche? An ancient queen? Perhaps an ancient alien? When a piece is clearly treasured by the same group who contest it as a fake, we always find such objects highly compelling. We previously covered what is undoubtedly one of the most peculiar ancient statues ever unearthed. Now known as the Lady of Elche, she mysteriously turned up in 1897, on a private estate two kilometers south of Elche, Spain. Her unusual headdress is obviously her most baffling characteristic, and a subject of heated debate to this day. Some claim that it is nothing but a mere fashion item, although their links to other ancient examples are reaching at best. Other theories pertain to them depicting some form of ancient advanced headphones, an antenna, or even that she was actually an ancient alien. An additional enigma surrounding the Lady of Elche is the cavity within her back, empty when discovered. The question is, why was the statue made in such a way? What was once placed within the statue? The information known about her is understandably extremely limited. 
she was long thought to be one of a kind, and as such, easily dismissed by academics as a mere one-off. However, it seems the lady wasn't actually unique. Additionally, she may have actually been a rather well-known figure to a civilization we are possibly yet to understand. Although the statue was found in Spain in 1969, in Richfield, Utah, another as yet unexplained object was found. Discovered at a depth of 6 feet, within soil that contained no other evidence of past disturbance, what some now think was once a buckle adorned with what clearly was an image of the Lady of Elche. The question is, who was the Lady of Elche? Why is an ancient medallion, presumed belt buckle, found within an empty field in Utah adorned with her image? Furthermore, upon the observance of the buckle, along with the bust of the Lady of Elche, is perhaps the most compelling clue pertaining to her identity discovered yet. Many people suggested that, due to the Lady of Elche's unusual existence and the claimed location of the discovery of the buckle, it was claimed that the Utah Lady was in fact a fake. However, after extensive research, the inscription upon the obverse was found to actually be authentic ancient Assyrian, translated as the Assyrian. Was this the original name for the Lady of Elche? Who were these particular-looking Assyrians? Was she a member of the civilization modern academia have permitted such extensive study of? If so, why are we not aware of such a clearly famous yet visually unique character? Were the Assyrians actually another lost, advanced, ancient civilization? Perhaps the inspiration for the name of the Assyrian culture we are so aware of? Are the real Assyrians being obscured by a claimed more recent imposter by academia? Or were they merely a weird fashion item? For now, her identity is still up for debate. However, such finds undoubtedly strengthen some highly compelling possibilities. We have recently covered many of the amazing archaeological ruins which can be found within modern-day Turkey, and it would be foolish of us not to devote a small fraction of our investigative minds on what is probably the most enigmatic of them all. Placed high atop a rather suspiciously shaped mountain known as Nimrut, Someone, at some time within our very distant past, went to tremendous efforts to create what academia have concluded was some sort of tomb. This however, absence of any king or queen's remains to date, or indeed any other form of evidence to support such claims. Said to have been constructed by the Kamajini Kingdom some 5,000 years ago, the enormous stone statues are placed at a height of 2,230 meters above sea level. Because of the site's clearly tremendous antiquity, coupled with the astonishing achievements involved in creating it, many people attribute the site as the eighth wonder of the world. Furthermore, and perhaps most intriguing regarding the ruins, is the fact that Mount Nimrud Da is one of the only places on Earth where a number of sunrises and sunsets can be observed. Every year, thousands of local and foreign tourists come to Nimrat Da to watch the sunrise and sunset. Was this particular anomaly found at this specific location a factor in the decision to place this mysterious structure at the top of Mount Nimrut? And if so, how did a culture more than 5,000 years ago understand this? The name Nimrut is a relatively modern one, dating back only to the Middle Ages. In Armenian legend, Haik defeated the biblical king Nimrod and buried him in these mountains, meaning the real name of the mountain at the time of the monumental structure's construction remains unknown. According to academia, quote, the tumulus or ceremonial mound at the site, which is 49 meters tall and 152 meters in diameter, was possibly built to protect a tomb from tomb robbers, since any excavation would quickly fill with loose rock. The statues appear to have Greek-style facial features, but Armenian clothing and hairstyling." End quote. We find it interesting that academics would happily mention the amazing characteristics included in the build. 
the hidden chambers beneath being booby-trapped with multiple tons of loose gravel, placed atop to quickly fill any tomb robbers' attempted burrowing tunnels, stifling their attempts to loot the site. Yet say, with their second breath, that the site was somehow looted sometime within antiquity. The site was excavated in 1881 by Carl Sester, a German engineer assessing transport routes for the Ottomans. However, his claim of a tomb have never been validated. Subsequent excavations have failed to reveal the tomb of Antiochus, the supposed character who resides here. This, however, has not deterred academia to continue to strongly argue that the site is indeed his burial site. Who built the ancient monumental structure high atop this mountain within Turkey? Why did they build it? Was it indeed constructed, like Alajahoyuk, by a far more advanced civilization than we are led to believe? The more we learn regarding these ancient sites, the more such a proposition becomes a real possibility. We have in the past covered the fascinating legends and indeed recovered artifacts that have been found over the years within the Ecuadorian cave system, known locally as Cueva de los Tayos. The legends of the cave nearly all surround hidden treasures of lost ancient and giant civilizations, including the posit of an ancient yet inexplicable library room made entirely from a curious metallic formula. With caves with an intrigue, strong enough to even attract the attention of the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, one began to wonder whether these legends be true. And when you bring Father Crespi's collection into the fold, the flurry of interest surrounding these legends, and indeed the artificial nature of some of the portions of the cave itself, all become easily explainable via such motives of discovery. Father Crespi, as the title would suggest, was a religious man and one who was highly philanthropic and also incredibly interested in the artifacts of antiquity. And fortunately for him and us, the location in which he lived was steeped in lost ancient artifacts, all just waiting to be recovered. Father Crespi was a man of modest wealth and in return for curious artifacts, often found within the Taos cave, even reported to have given food in return for clear forgeries, offered by hungry individuals, although he would offer more and often money, respective of the artifact's clearly historical value. This allowed Father Crespi to gather a literal hoard of authentic ancient artifacts, many clearly from this long claim to exist metallic library his collection full of metallic plates of unknown writings and other fascinating metallic artifacts. The reason for our revisiting of these caves, and indeed the fascinating character that was Father Crespi, is our recent perusing of new information released on the cave, deliberately ignoring all aforementioned facts, including the artificial nature of some of the portions of the cave itself in particular at entrances, as if reinforced with enormous ancient lintels. Unfortunately, all that remains of Father Crespi's collection that can be confirmed as 100% his and authentic now only exist within the photos taken of him with his collection prior to his death, whereas the hoard of artifacts was ransacked and many replaced with poor quality forgeries. Thus, it is a mystery, and we believe conspiracy to conceal a lost history, which we find incredibly frustrating. Alexander the Great was a member of the Arjad dynasty. He was born in Pella, central Macedonia in Greece in the year 356 BC. He succeeded his father Philip II to the throne at the age of just 20 and spent most of his ruling life on continuous military campaigns through Asia and Northeast Africa. In just 10 years, by the age of 30, he had successfully created one of the largest empires of the ancient world, stretching from Greece to India. Undefeated in battle, he is widely considered history's most successful military commander. The final resting place of this Macedonian king is one of the greatest mysteries of ancient history. No one has apparently been able to locate any evidence to suggest where he could have been buried. 
Recently, however, archaeologists claims that the actual tomb of Alexander was discovered and that this discovery was blocked by the Greek and Egyptian governments and has been ever since. Alexander died in a mysterious death at the age of 32 in Babylon in 323 BC. He had been holding a memorial feast to honor the passing of a close friend when he suddenly suffered intense pain and collapsed. He was taken to his bedchamber where, after days of agony, he fell into a coma and died. Scholars still debate the cause of death. Alexander was embalmed and a golden chariot was built to transfer his body to the sanctuary of Ammon. When the procession made it to the border between Syria and Egypt, it was met by Ptolemy, who stole the body. Its location along with all artifacts ever since have remained a mystery. In the early 1980s, a man named Russell Burroughs claimed he stumbled upon a hidden cave somewhere near Olney. He apparently found human remains, metal weapons, and an ancient language carved into gold tablets. Stranger still, the language was Middle Eastern and European in origin and not from any known American Indian culture. What was astonishing about this apparent discovery was the fact that many artifacts recovered from the site strongly suggested that they were connected to the tomb of Alexander. The reason he claims his find has been covered up was realized by Virginia Hurrigan and Harry Hubbard, who upon deciphering the writings and cataloging the artifacts realized that they detailed numerous close encounters with extraterrestrial life apparently including a specific species of reptilians. Their work, which they maintain possession of, has been disclosed across the web, with a large selection of photographic studies of said objects. Are the powers that be hiding the fact that past rulers throughout history have been in contact with beings from other planets? Many have claimed through the subsequent years that Russell Burroughs' artifacts are frauds, and he still refuses to reveal the location of the hidden cave. However, it could also be seen as a smokescreen, obscuring from public view a real find of significant historical importance. Around the same time, many archaeologists came forward claiming Liana Suvalzi to have found the elusive tomb, just where it should have been all along. Yet they also claimed that her discoveries were indeed covered up, and it would seem with the help of Russell Burroughs' debunked find, it was successfully concealed from the world. Just what could there be in this tomb that is such a threat to modern understanding? What could be so earth-shaking that it would lead to an international cover-up? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching, guys, and until next time, take care. Tutankhamun is not only the most famous of all the pharaohs, but he is unquestionably the character most wrapped in mystery. Although many are attracted to the legends of the unexplained curse or flock to the Cairo Museum to peer upon his wondrous relics, what many are unaware of is a rather incredible theory pertaining to an as-yet undiscovered vault, hidden in plain sight within his own purported ancient tomb. Known as the Second Chamber Theory, it was initially put forward by British Egyptologist Nicholas Reeves. He argued that it was the secret burial chamber of Nefertiti, who was originally the wife of Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten. Legends say that she was one of the most beautiful women in history. Reeves argues that, due to King Tut dying suddenly, he was hastily buried in the outer chamber of Nefertiti's tomb, with the opening to her chamber then concealed somewhere within the tomb many millennia ago. Again, a tomb unlooted, filled to the rafters with priceless golden relics. Reeves even claims that he himself detected a hidden passageway behind a funerary painting on one of the walls of the tomb. Thus, in 2016, an American survey team harnessing ground-penetrating radar peered into and beyond the walls within the tomb. However, they were unable to confirm nor reject the second chamber theory. Yet this did not dissuade anyone who had become convinced of the theory, coming to this conclusion via different avenues of study, continuing to be convinced of the theory's validity. So, after another unsuccessful attempt, a third was arranged by a new Minister of Antiquities set at a media conference, stating he would conduct a third GPR analysis to, quote, put an end to the debate. The third survey, led by Francesco Porcelli of the Polytechnic University of Turin, subsequently came forward to publicly state, beyond doubt, that there was no hidden chambers within the tomb. However, this entire sequence of events can simply be perceived as a rather hazy attempt 
to put people off from covering this story, diverting attention away from its possible truth. Firstly, why three attempts to confirm that a chamber did not exist? For why would the first two attempts have openly admitted that they were not able to confirm such claims without doubt? How could a person from such an institution, if not funded to come to such a definitive conclusion, make such a post-statement? And why would so many from different academic backgrounds arrive at the same conclusion? Is there a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb? And if so, why is it being hidden? What could be inside it? We find the possibilities incredibly intriguing. Tucked away in the bowels of the Israel Museum within Jerusalem is a small, inconspicuous artifact that if the claims of its origins, believed by many independent researchers and scholars alike, be true, it would support the existence of a remarkable treasure, which countless individuals over the millennia have become convinced of its existence. Yet their efforts to discover this treasure were all to no avail. Yet a small ivory pomegranate, about the size of an adult's thumb, with some rather intriguing inscriptions still readable upon it, could possibly prove those who believe in its existence right all along. The object's Paleo-Hebrew inscription contains the divine name of Yahweh, which was used by the ancient Israelites. If authentic, then this small ivory pomegranate may be a still-existing head of a scepter of King Solomon, which could have only been found within a treasure and possible tomb, which many claim still remains beneath Solomon's temple itself. What makes this treasure so incredibly intriguing, if indeed it existed, along with its gold and silver relics, and the aforementioned scepters and canes, was that with this collection has long been claimed to have been the storage place for the Ark of the Covenant, whose location is also continually debated by many different fields of interest. The scepter's head's authenticity has, predictably, been dismissed by some and argued as real by others yet having first came to the attention of the public over 30 years ago. Its discovery and possible incredible origins have received a suspiciously low level of media attention. Paleographer André Lemaire initially stumbled across the ivory pomegranate in 1979, for sale in an antiquity shop in Jerusalem. Lemaire published a note on the object in the French scholarly journal Revue Biblique in 1981, and by his 1984 issue of BAR, the inscribed ivory pomegranate was really beginning to be looked at seriously. For 15 years, the inscribed ivory pomegranate could be seen at the Israel Museum, displayed in a special room with a direct beam of light on it. In 2005, however, a committee comprised of Israel Antiquities Authority and Israel Museum Scholars published a report in the Israel Exploration Journal concluding that the inscription was a forgery. However, this claim by the individuals who forensically examined the object originally were later redacted, stating they could not confirm its authenticity yet were reluctant to state it as authentic. Yet regardless, it is now curiously protected and not on display. Is this object really a surviving relic from the treasures of the Temple of Solomon? Does this support the possibility that other treasures, specifically the Ark of the Covenant, could really exist? We find such possibility highly compelling.